Well, let's get into the first section here. It talks about the certainty of Christ's return. Now, this marks the beginning of eternity and reaching this perfect unity. And we're also in this series, we're kind of going through some of the foundational doctrines that talk about this unity. The return of Christ. Uh, when did we first begin to hear about the second coming of Jesus? Wasn't it after his first coming? Or do we first hear about the second coming of Jesus even in the Old Testament? Which is it? The second coming, matter of fact, the Jews in Jesus' day, one reason they didn't accept him is they had been reading the prophecies about the second coming and they didn't understand the prophecies about his first coming and they thought, you can't be the Messiah because you're supposed to come like a, a roar of a lion. You're supposed to come with fire. You'll plead with all flesh, the Bible says. The Lord will come and with fire he'll plead. But what is this guy riding around on a donkey and that's not our Messiah. We expected something a little, they're thinking about the second coming. So the prophecies about the second coming go all the way back. But you know what I'd like to emphasize is the Bible is so clear that this is not it. That the Lord is going to come. And for those who are worshiping with us today, in our sermon later, we're also going to be talking about the second coming. But so it's very fresh in my mind. But um, it is so important to know that things are not going to go on like this indefinitely. And that there's going to be a culmination. The, the second coming of Jesus is the climax of history on earth. Let's look at some verses that talk about this. How many of you have memorized John chapter 14, the first three verses? Those promises. Karen raised her hand. I knew she would. That's a, I see another. This is where Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, what's the next part? I will come again. Is that definitive? Now, did he go? He said, if I go, I will come. So he's going to come back. That's a promise he's made. Now, people say, well, when, Lord? It seems like it's taking a long time. When God first promised to Adam and Eve that he would send his son, how long was it from the promise in the Garden of Eden when he said that the seed would strike the serpent's head? How long until Jesus' first coming? 4,000 years. Uh, don't you think some of them thought that was a long time? So is God late? Or is he operating right the way he normally does? <laughs> All right, look at another one. We just, uh, we'll read this one again later as well. Titus 2.13 looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, is Jesus just Savior or he's the great what? Great God and Savior. He's not dividing them. Our great God and our Savior are going to be two different people. He's identifying Jesus as our great God and Savior. It's like when Christ rose from the dead, it says that Thomas, when he appeared to Thomas the second week, Thomas missed him the first week, and Jesus said, Thomas, look, don't be doubting. Here's the scars in my hand and my side. He knelt and he said, my Lord and my God. Right? So Jesus is our great God and our Savior. Christ is God the Son. He's eternal. There's been a lot of discussion about that lately. Some are uh, letting go of that truth. Jude 14. Now here's Jude quoting from uh, a, a text, and this is kind of an apocryphal text. It's called the Book of Enoch that the Jews had. It probably was not written by Enoch, but it was written by some Babylonian author, one of the Jews in Babylon. And, uh, but there's one part of it that Jude quotes and believes is evidently true. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, saying, Behold, the Lord comes. And so uh, it was understood that, now did Enoch live before or after the flood? Before the flood. So the idea of the Lord coming how far back does it go? It says that he was coming and that he wasn't coming alone as well. It says, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Not ten thousand, ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds. It's a time of judgment which they have committed in an ungodly way and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. There is a day of judgment. The Lord is going to come. And so that he says, this is Enoch, Enoch prophesied of these. Now, is it possible that Enoch said that? And Jude said that he did. Here's another Old Testament 
prophecy about the second coming. In a moment, I'm going to ask someone to read uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. You'll have that, okay? Psalms 50, verse 3. Our God shall come. Is that clear? Yes. Our God shall come and not keep silent. It's not a secret coming. Secret rapture. A fire shall devour before him, and it will be very tempestuous, stormy, all about him. Storms of glory. He will call to the heavens from above and the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together to me, those who've made a covenant with me by sacrifice. So here he's even saying, gather my saints, which is what our next verse is. Why don't you read that for us? The verse says, uh, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead of Christ will rise first. Very good. Thank you. And of course, that's 1 Thessalonians 4.16. There again, he's talking about he will come and gather his saints. The dead in Christ shall rise. Even in the Old Testament, it says the Lord will come. He's going to gather them. Not only will the dead in Christ rise, what happens to the living when he comes? Those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet them together in the clouds. And so there's a gathering that happens. There's a judgment that happens when the Lord comes. Zechariah 14. This is a verse that has caused some confusion. But he's pretty clear about this part. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two. Now, you've heard about the first coming of the Lord. And what happens after the first coming? What happens after the first of anything? Second, second coming. How many of you have heard of the second coming? Yeah. Okay. How many of you have heard a good sermon on the third coming? Is there a third coming? Yes. So when the Lord comes next, sequentially, he doesn't touch the earth. We are caught up to meet him. The dead in Christ rise to meet him. He says, I take you to the mansions which I prepared. Didn't we just read that? We live and reign with him for a thousand years. We're not here on earth reigning over the destruction and the wicked. That's, uh, that's what some churches teach. I don't believe the Bible teaches that. There's a judgment that's taking place. At the end of the 1,000 years, the new Jerusalem comes down. The Lord raises all the wicked. The Bible says the rest of the dead don't live again until the 1,000 years is finished, which means they do live again after the 1,000 years are finished. God raises all the wicked. Jesus said there's a... Right, the uh, resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the unjust. He comes back with the new Jerusalem and he actually, when he calls forth the wicked, he touches the, his feet to the Mount of Olives. That is the third coming. So if someone is walking around the world and they're on the earth in the near future and they say they're Jesus, how do we know it's not Jesus? One very clear, simple fact. Christ is never touching the ground the second coming. He doesn't touch the ground again until the third coming. So anybody walking around and says, I'm Jesus, you know right away he's a false Christ. He said, that coming will be like lightning shining from the east to the west. Lightning is up in the sky. We're going to be caught up to meet him in the air. So then there's the third coming. Now this is all moving towards this unity that we're talking about. That must happen. That's when it says that with fire he will plead with all flesh. There's a great judgment. When the wicked finally seek to take the city, all the wicked are called Gog and Magog. They surround the beloved city. Christ then rises up on his white throne. All are judged. Every knee will bow. Fire comes down from God out of heaven, devours the wicked and the devil and his angels. They're all cast into this lake of fire that's formed from this rain. You ever seen a lot of rain form a lake? I have. Um, there's some places in the world where it dries up in the summer. It turns into a lake in the winter. And there's a lake of fire all around the world. God is going to use that fire to purify the planet. But just like a moat around a castle, that lake of fire will surround the new Jerusalem. It will not be harmed. When the fire goes out, God is then on the ashes of this purified world going to create a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And it talks about that the saved will go forth and tread upon the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. Blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. This is the time those verses all come true. And that's a time when we'll have the perfect restoration of unity. Here's another verse, and I better wrap up my second coming verses. I, there's a lot of them. Isaiah 66, verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with chariots like a whirlwind, 
to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword the Lord will judge all flesh and the slain of the Lord will be many. The Bible says it's, it's not going to be good news for most of the world when Jesus comes. Isn't that what it tells us? Then all the tribes of the earth, they'll see the sign of his coming in the heavens and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Let's talk about the majority of people because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life and few find it, few want to find it. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. It seems like the majority go down that wrong road. And uh, that, by the way, was Matthew 24, verse 30. But it says, the Son of Man, his sign will appear in the heavens. So when he comes again, he's in the heavens. We're caught up to meet him. All right, now we're going to talk about the promised restoration. 